It's Rand Delicious. Welcome to the SEO Rand. I am your host, Morty Over. Did you might know me better as Wix's head of SEO brand, but I'll remind you, this podcast is pure unofficial Morty Magic and Morty Mania for official ish magic and mania or less on the mania side. Check out Wix's Serps Up podcast over at Wix.com slash SEO slash learn slash podcast. Pitching another podcast on a podcast show because it's my podcast and I'll pitch whatever I want. The SEO rant is found at the SEO rant.com at SEO rant on Twitter, which I still refuse to call X. And wherever you consume podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, I can't say Stitcher anymore. That was such a good alliteration. It was Stitcher, Spotify, but Stitcher is gone. So no Stitcher, but uh, Apple Podcasts, wherever you consume podcasts, we're there. SEO Rant comes out typically on Thursdays, sometimes on Fridays. So it does actually make sense to subscribe so you're automatically notified. Whatever. The pitching part is over. For your listening pleasure today, he is an OG. He goes way back. If you're an SEO, if you've been an SEO vet, you'll remember this man, but not from what he does now. He's a brand strategist, brand consultant. He used to be over at Moz. He's Ron L. Smith. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I was breaking into the industry like 10 years ago. You were one of the dudes. You were like one of the names that I would see all over the place and doing all the great stuff over at Moz. So it is an honor to speak with you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Morty. I, I love what you guys are doing at Wix as well. And uh, the last 10 years, I, I would say my career is very chameleonic. I go through these spurts, these fits and starts of I'm really interested in this and I'll, you know, dive into a topic and just uh, consume all that I consume, learn what I can learn and then share it. So uh, I was a kid who in college read every physics book or every I would read, find a topic and I just read every book in, on the shelf. So I'm I'm kind of weird like that. That's not weird. That's awesome. Um, but before we get started, <laughs> pitch. You know, what are you what are you offering? What do you do? What can people get you know get from you? So mainly, I do brand strategy. I mean, I I cut my teeth in the content marketing space uh, as a content writer, and then con- what we call content strategy. What I've always kind of been known for is kind of a product marketing, product strategy guy, but always around helping young companies grow their brand. Uh, if you go back, you know, go back to 2005, I was helping companies like uh, working with companies like Yeti, uh, which is I look at where they are now. Right. Um, so I've always tried to help companies understand what I call the core tenets of branding. And that's, you know, understanding your audience and then, you know, figuring what they care about and how you can get in front of them as a de facto choice. So uh, that's what I mainly do now. Main, the difference now is I work with a lot of small businesses. Um, uh, I, I mean, I've, I've been very fortunate to work with everything from finance company, from fintech to, you know, John apparel retailers to, you know, sporting goods to healthcare. Um, uh, but now I, I really enjoy working with, with small business. Which is what we're talking about today. Uh, we're talking about small businesses and how they can leverage branding for blogs. So where, where do you want to start with this one? Cause I think, I think we have a lot to say. Yeah. So. One of the things I've been very fortunate to do, and I, and I think I try to share the things I've learned from working with really, really big brands because big brands have tons of data. And so what we always said for years when I worked for ESPN is the innovation comes at the small business level, right? But at enterprise is where those those uh, those ideas get shared, right? Because they have the revenue and the resources to put behind it. But a couple, having worked with the, with a few of the biggest brands in our space, and you can imagine what their names are, one of the things that you that I saw was what was holding brands back, right? Like if you look at a lot of the platforms, what what many people want is I just need a blog. You know, we you know we're big in the SEO space. We talk about you know the ecom or you know we need something for enterprise. But the the non consumption, what I call it, is um, the people who don't have don't use your product, you know, whatever that product is is always bigger than the number of people who use your product, right? So spending some time going after those people. And so for, for me in the small business space, what I see is a lot, of, a lot of bloggers just want a simple platform. And then, so they throw up a blog, but the next biggest issue is how do I get traffic to it? And so what, what I often help small businesses with is, is you need to build a brand around that. Like, why are people going to choose you? And you, and, and, that's that's the way that I think about it, and so just getting them to start thinking around those those um, those ideas. Yeah, and it's so funny to hear you say it like that because if in the SEO space you would first start off like, hey, like what can we rank and what can we get you traffic on, and you're not thinking broader, you're not thinking holistically around, okay, how do we create identity and how do we get that identity out there so that you're offering something that people can, you, it's distinct. People can say, oh, okay, 
they're doing this that's different from anything else I've seen. I'd be curious to go to that. And it's a very different mindset than it's a SEO per se. So for years, I always thought, I, I suffered from what uh, economists call the curse of knowledge. I always thought that what I know, everybody else knows, right? What, I, what I'm being challenged with, everybody else is being challenged with, but they know how to solve it. So at, at various points in my life, I've been interested in, in topics and I'll learn everything that I can about that topic. And then I'll try to go out and grab that audience or, or, or you know, I, I know that he was associated with it and I want to, you know, rank for that. Right. So, for example, you know, when I first started in content marketing, you know, 15 years ago, I created a, a newsletter or created a website and I built traffic, but I, did, I had no revenue. And that was because I wasn't a de facto brand in that space. And the people that I was attracting weren't people who were ever going to be my customers. Well, I saw and see the same things with bigger brands. We spend a lot. They spent a lot of time chasing traffic that was never going to bring them qualified leads. And so just, you know, getting their mindset, getting big brands' mindset around, okay, listen, th this is a really big market. These people are never going to be in your wheelhouse. And this is why you're not the brand for them. So for me, with small businesses, it's the exact same thing. It's just, it's just, you know, a much smaller scale. And we're often a lot closer to it. So, you know, the, the way that I think about it is, you know, you have to know what it is that you offer and the audience that you're going to be chasing after. And that comes before you start assigning keywords and going after those. Yeah. And we were just talking about this right before the podcast. I mean, you know, we just saved this for the podcast where doing that in the era of AI or the age of AI gives you the ability to become differentiated and it gives you the ability to become top of mind, which I think is incredibly important right now. Because in SEO, we're always so okay, get the conversion, get the get in front of you know, get on get high up on Google, get the ranking, get the conversion. But I don't think people I speculate in the speculation that people don't buy that way anymore. And as AI kind of takes over the ecosystem, we'll definitely not buy that way anymore. It's going to be much be much more aligned to brand identity. This is something that I trust. I know that you're real, I know that your content is trustworthy and you're top of mind. I'm gonna go to you and not be get driven by wherever you are in the ecosystem, but I'll see where you are at various stages of my research and then come back around to you later on. So this is this goes back to the whole concept I, I coined uh, nine years ago called found versus chosen. In the SEO space, and you can still see this on very, some very prominent blogs, is they'll say, you know, we help you get found. And what I say is, okay, I want you, what, what we really want is to get chosen. So I'll give you the example. I work with a small business. I mean, this, this goes back 19 years ago. They had an amazing product, but it wasn't selling. And what I talked to the product, the, um, the owner about is why would they choose you if you're on the show? They know nothing about you. They don't know how it's going to work, right? You, you're going to have to create an emotional uh, connection to, to the, your audience for them to, to buy that product. And so that's over time what happened. He was able to get in some retail stores. He, had, uh, he, he put up some educational videos such that people formed an, an emotional connection such that when they saw that product on the shelf, they bought it. It's the same thing happens in the SERPs. When I've worked with sporting goods retailers who say I have a better shoe than Nike or, or I have a, you know, a better sweater or a, a hoodie than an Adidas, I say, okay, well, why are they going to choose you in the SERPs? And often I'll pull it up and I'll say, okay, if your brand's in the top 10, but a Nike and Adidas or whoever is above you, what have you done to create an association to make them say, I'm going to choose you? And often um, that's, that's when they can really see, you know what, eh, I haven't done that. And so that really drives home what's often happening on the front end. You know, I, I don't have the sales. I don't have the traffic to my website, right? I'm spending a lot of time um, going after an audience that's not receptive to me. And that's because I haven't put in the work on the front end. I feel like it's such a simple point, but I think it goes underappreciated. The power of having that relationship with a brand or that brand having a relationship with their, with their consumer base, it seems so obvious. Like, yeah, you need to have a relationship. People will choose you if you have a relationship. But I think it's one of those things we kind of like, we assume we kind of gloss over it, but we don't really fundamentally understand the power of that. Yes, it's very so, subtle. So, no, no, so yeah, you look at it, it. most people look at what's happening with big brands who have tons of name recognition and they think I can just copy that product or service and then, you know, for my audience, right? Whatever it is that they're doing, right? Without realizing it's the association, it's the affinity, it's what's created in that person's mind, right? I'll give you an example. If you go back to the 80s, and I was I was really young at that time, so I don't remember this when the Michael Jordan 2 came out, right? I was just gonna go to Michael Jordan. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, that was an incredibly expensive shoe. And to get people to to purchase something that which at that time, you know, it's it like LV today, Louis Vuitton to, to pay a hundred dollars for a shoe. 
But in their mind, that association with the top athlete was, you know what, I'm going to buy this shoe and I'm going to, quote unquote, be like Mike. Right. And so people walked around and they felt special because people looked at them as special. And so they were able to create such distance, right, as a new brand, right, between the competition and the would-be competition by creating that association, that affinity. It, it's, I was just talking about this on LinkedIn. I, I think what people don't necessarily realize, like the Michael Jordan case is like the epitome. It's like the, it's the best case. You can really see like yeah. very clearly like that association to be like between the shoe and the person and the consumer, it works. And it's funny because when you talk, when you think about it, Nike wasn't saying anything about their shoe. It was pure association. It was yeah. like very Freudian. Yeah. Like I associate yeah. shoe with Michael and Michael with greatness and we're all connected now. I will get the shoe. And I think that, and this ties back to small brands. I think small brands have a tremendous amount of power here to, and to use something like their blog to do this. I don't think if Nike did what they did with Michael Jordan now that it would still work. Because the way people relate to athletes and the way people relate to famous people and the way they relate to buying things and consuming and consuming and to big brands is very different than the early 90s and the late 80s. It's a completely different beast. And I think people don't want that fantastical. Like Michael Jordan, you know, yeah. jumping over Spike Lee <laughs> is fantastical. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, it was great back then, but there's a certain element of like, that's not normal. That's not me. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a certain... Um, connection that people are looking between the brand and real life and themselves. It's a much more realer association than it was back in the day. And I feel like big brands have a harder time pivoting. Nike, I was reading about this. They wanted, they're trying to pivot for the Paris games and rebranding and yada, 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 because they've stagnated. And it's very hard for a big brand like Nike to go, you know what we have to do? That whole model we were based on, that whole branding element, that whole way of psycholo psychologizing everything, that's not how it works anymore. A much smaller brand is much more human off the bat than a Nike ever will be. And aligning to what users are looking to consume, that human element, that grassroots organic kind of feel. If you're a smaller brand, you can you can create that branding. Mm -hmm. A few blog mm -hmm. posts, a well-positioned language, mm -hmm. a, a design language that really comes off as being connective. Really easily, whereas a big brand, a Wix, a Nike, a WordPress, a Shopify has a tremendously difficult time creating an actual human connection with you that you want now, whereas their branding was much more corporate, still is much more corporate than it, than it ever needs to be. And they can't move away from that because they're a big brand. It's very hard for them. So the way you just position that is spot on. And it's what I've been saying for nearly 20 years. What small brands think they should emulate is the popularity in this in, and they love to have the size of a giant brand what they don't realize is what they have is what big brands envy and that's nimbleness right yep. so when i worked for espn one of the things that i would see all the time with these companies that were worth 100 to 200 million dollars who would envy the company that, that was at 20 to 40 million dollars and that was a function of there was so much bureaucracy in a much bigger brand that felt like they had to be everything for everybody, whereas that 20 to $40 million brand could just say, hey, you know what? We're going to be exactly who we are for our small subset of customers. And so they, they, they were doing what's called over-serving their niche. They were going to be the de facto choice that when, when their customers needed X, they were going to come to them. One of the examples I use when I consult research, uh, I'm sorry, re restaurants on, on, with regard to branding is I help them understand when I come to your restaurant and your menu is a book, I, I expect you not to be well. Nobody does everything well. And you have to remember, remember what you're cementing in people's mind. And so if you think about from a branding perspective, if I come in, I have a great restaurant experience. I'm not going to trust you as a brand because I'm thinking, you know what? Well, there's probably a, this may have been good, but there's a bunch of other stuff on, in the menu that's not, right? So I'm, I'm reluctant to uh, recommend you. So what I what I what I try to drive home to them is use the advantage you have at your disposal by being closer to your audience. You can sample, right? You can look at your reviews, and in, 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 you can think in terms of what is it that I, my customer, my core customer, cares the most about, and let me focus on that. I was talking to a brand recently, and they were talking how can, how can we position ourselves as a thought leader? I'm like, why why would you want to do that? <laughs> they're, they're, 
the big brand could be the thought leader. They have the fancy marketing person. They have a big name. They have whoever. There's many more ways to position yourself beyond being a thought leader. I feel like, like everyone yeah. defaults. I got to be a thought leader. You could be grassroots. You could be connected. You can be organic. That big brand that you're competing with cannot do that. Why would you try to fight them on being this ginormous thought leader and data and whatever? When you could just have a much more organic and grassroots feel to your content and position yourselves in a way that that other brand can never do. Yeah. So if you look at it, so um, Clay Christensen, who's the founder of Disrupt Disruptive Innovation, uh, I called him the mentor that, that I never knew. He taught at Harvard, and I didn't go to Harvard. Um, so I've read I've read every one of his books. I look at every one of his videos and, and podcasts, and you know he talks about the first mover advantage and the last mover advantage. And in in reality, what you want to do is, is think of it this way. Who are the people that I'm uniquely qualified to serve? And what are the things they care most about that I could deliver to them? And then from there, you just make the gradual step to I want to be, when they think of X, that person. So I think of brands that I've worked with here or that I know and, and have had conversations with, whether it's an insurance, whether it's a specific meal, um, is what I what I what I teach them is okay. Who are, who are the people who continually show up? Right? What do they care most about? Now that should be a very small group. And so what you want to do is take that ver that core customer and say, how do I overserve them? What are the things that I can add or do better than everybody else? What the danger is, what people start doing is they start looking around. They start thinking, you know what? I need to do this because they're taking market share from me. In reality, when you start going outside your wheelhouse, you're, you're going to lose market share because it allows somebody else to come in. And so, you know, Clay Christensen talked about that all the time, that people, that brands that begin to focus on areas that weren't their core area, let new entrants come in. And, and that's, that's a recipe for obsolescence. And so I, I always drive home that point. You know, when you talk about top of mind awareness, talking about, you know, building a, a, a brand, First, it begins with what is the thing you're most qualified to, del to deliver to, a, to an audience that cares about that and then is willing to pay for it. I love the way you phrase that because often what brands will do is, okay, what does the customer need? What do they want? And it's all very <laughs> external. But really, good brand identity and uh, brand positioning is the combination of who am I and who are you yeah. and where's the, where yeah. is the overlap between those two ideas? It's not yeah. just like external, okay, whatever the client needs, not whatever the client needs. You have to do your yeah. thing. Yeah. So that's the one, that was always the thing I loved about content strategy and how I always helped small brands understand the need for it. They would always think it began with the needs of the customer. And I said, man, that's a recipe for disaster. It's, you know, what are your business needs and how can you tie that to the needs of your audience? Because what, what ultimately happens is when you don't focus on that, you become overextended, right? Like I, I consult some small agencies here in, in my town. And one of the things that when I look at their books, they're like, well, no, come in, come in and advise me because we're really struggling. In every case, it's they're serving an audience that's not now and will, nor will it ever be their core audience. It's just a matter of that audience needed something. Hey, you know, I can go over here and do this, but they're overextending themselves. And then what happens, they end up losing their core customer so one of them who's a friend of mine, I'm saying, okay, you got to get to the core of what is the thing you can over deliver on, right? How does that help you meet your objectives? And then what audience is served by that, right? And I said, you got you to remember, Al Rees, one of the foremost marketing uh, uh, experts said, you should focus so narrowly that it scares you, right? And that's, it's the one time you want to be siloed, right? And so that's what I, what I always... It's, it was scary for me in 2012 when I when I started full-time consulting, but it's also scary for brands. But I said, I tell small businesses, look at the most successful businesses in your vertical. Unless they have tons of private equity behind them, they focus really narrowly. They're not all over the board wasting revenue and resources. I I, I love this because like, I'm just making a note to myself now. It's like, when I, I have something I want to talk about, like, later on, not on this podcast, somewhere else, like this idea of identity and doubling down on identity. It's not really discussed. And you, you, you read all like the brand marketing stuff. It's all, 
a lot about distribution, a lot about, you know, uh, you know, catering to the audience and targeting audiences and yada, 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 or your business design, your, your, your branding design, but building identity. I don't want to get like too, I love existential philosophy. And so I don't want to get too, like, too transcendental with this, but I, the idea of creating an identity that people can grab onto and, and connect with. I don't think we appreciate how powerful that is psychologically mm -hmm. and almost like philosophically or right, spiritually, for lack of a better word, and and how much of a mover that is for people to make a decision about you is being able to connect to that <laughs> identity. So I'll give you a great example. So 10 years ago, 2014, my daughters had this amazing uh, cinnamon roll, like a donut, right? And I was like, I've never had a cinnamon roll that good. It was so good. My wife would go get them every Saturday. So I ended up meeting the lady. She had this tiny cake shop and I would go in and pick up the, the donuts and I would say, you know, you know, what are you? And she said, well, we just do the cinnamon rolls on the side on the weekend. We're really a, a design, a, 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 um, what do you call it, a high end cake shop. And I said, you know, what what area do you specialize? She said, she said well, no, we do them for special occasions. We do, you know, for whatever. So about six, seven months in, I go in and one of the, the, the owners, uh, one of the workers there was saying they're struggling you know, the market they really wanted to go after and pay them the most money and that they're most qualified to live on, the, mar the market was slow. And I said, why don't you guys specialize? And she said, oh, I, just, I, just feel, I just feel funny about that. I said, well, think about it. The owner got started in the wedding cake market. She's really well known throughout DFW in that area. So what I did was I went home, I did some research and I saw that there was, there was a hole in the market for that service and there was people who were not going after those keywords, specifically small brands that, that could build an affinity, right? And I was like, yeah, you're looking at it because she had a brother who was in SEO. You're looking at it from the perspective of all the competition around this specific keyword that you're never going to be able to compete on. And I said, well, but yeah, but you're a lot close, closer to the audience than the grocery stores are. So what I, the information I gave her, I said, what if you became the wedding cake lady? I said, just give it a try. She is the wedding cake lady now. Because I, what I said was, Think about this. A wedding cake is three thousand dollars. If people know that they can that that other people can trust you with their wedding cake, oh yeah, I can trust you with my kid's birthday cake, right? I can trust you with my wife's, you know, our anniversary cake. And so that's the way I, I I tell people. I said if you focus in very narrowly, you'll have all this peripheral area that you can move into that still aligns with your core audience. But if people don't know why they should come to you or why they should read your blog. Um, you know, you, you don't build that association. They're all over the board. And that's when you start seeing the dips in traffic. Like the people, if they think about you, they'll, they'll visit your blog. If they don't, they won't. Yep. You know, speaking of finding opportunities and keywords, just want to say also ask. Minds and organizes Google people also ask data in real time, showing you the next most likely question your searcher is going to ask. Best of all, it's completely free to try. You don't even need to create an account. Also ask has the world's only API for people also ask data, meaning you can combine this data directly with AI tools such as ChatGPT to supercharge your content briefs and write great content at scale. Go to alsoask.com and use code SEO rant to get 10% off it's funny that you're talking about like the dips and the dives and I, it, if you do have an identity it is far more consistent and it's interesting because it does open up other opportunities like you're talking about like hey if i i know to come to you for a wedding cake if i have to do an anniversary cake like, do you do you also do that and i think what people don't realize or maybe I, I feel like don't appreciate because it's it's a it's a hard thing to take your foot off the gas pedal if you focus in on something, you create an identity around something. I find in general, the, like the best thing about doing good marketing is momentum. It's one thing opens a door for the next thing, which opens a door for the next thing, which opens a door for the next thing. But if you don't handle that first thing right, there is no opening of the next door. Right. So one of the things I think about is, uh, I, like I said, I've worked with a number of athletic apparel companies. Uh, New Balance was not one of them. But if you look at in the, the running space, like Brooks, Mizuno, Asics, um, Saucony, New Balance are huge. But New Balance has, has really done a great job of saying, yes, we, we make a running shoe and we're going to, you know, we're really good at that. But peripheral to that are athletic shoes. Right? So, so for, for a period of time, about like seven, eight, nine years ago, New Balance had the top training shoe for, for gym, right? A minimalist training shoe. 
And what they had done was was said, okay, there's only about five brands in the running space, premium running shoes. We're one of them. But what do people who run also do? They also exercise. They are also, also in the gym, right? And so what happens with also with bigger brands, going back to what we said earlier, who, who, who do everything well, is there's often the trust and not and not the top. Uh, often they lack the trust and not don't have the top of mind awareness. So people say, okay, I need the best, right? So the example is when I ran, Nike was a really it was a good running shoe, but it wasn't considered one of the best, right? So for me, the brand that I trusted was New Balance, or if, if Saucony or A6 or whatever had had done the same thing, I would have trusted them as well. So the way to think about that is if you do something really really well. That top of mind awareness, it was transferable, right? Like, 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 think about it. If you see Michael Jordan, a really good basketball player, if you've never seen him play golf, you assume he's probably pretty good, right? Right? He may not be, but but the assumption, right? Because yeah. most people think in terms of it's transferable if it's peripheral. However, you don't naturally assume he's going to be a good GM and he's not been, right? <laughs> and that's the that's the whole overextension. And I talk about this all the time with, with the local businesses that I work with. I said, just think about it. If you focus in narrowly, um, then you can move peripherally to those areas. So I, I think about some, some of the small businesses I work with and I'll say, yes, yeah, you need a blog. I said, I said, even if it's not, you're not relying on web traffic. I said, it's going to condition you to learn more and care more about your audience. It gives you a public face and it's easier for them to form an association with you if you're creating content. And I said, from there, you can create videos. It also often makes it more palatable for them to get out of their, their way and create uh, social media content as well. And I said, no, 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 you're not looking for it to bring you business yet, right? And, and that's also one of the other things I talk about with certainly with small and new blogs is what you need now is to condition yourself to start sharing information. And the key there, and this is a, a very important that I want to make, is when you think about it, a blog and what you're able to do, what you really want to become is that expert. If you look at what, what all the people talk, what all people talk about now, you know, social media is sending so little traffic to blogs. The reality is it's still sending traffic to blogs. Social still sending traffic. To blogs. If you're the person in that space, right, that people want to hear from. And that's not because you're posting something on Facebook and hoping people like and comment. You're sharing stuff on Twitter or Facebook that people know they can't get anywhere else. I've seen this with restaurants. I've seen this with clothing stores who, who show, who show uh, young men how to tie a tie for the prom or their homecoming or whatever. And people go in and buy that tie or buy the, those shoes. Same thing with a restaurant. You know, restaurant owners on their blog share it through social media, teaching people how to cook a dish, right? It's it's that association, that affinity, that, that awareness, that Carry, will carry you through. So having a blog is important, even if you're not using it as a main driver of your business. Absolutely. There's so much branding and just being that that person who's helping you educate, who's helping you do. It's a very, it's a very, very powerful relationship. One of the most powerful relationships out there in the world is teacher student. It's yeah. a very, yeah. almost like a parent. As, as a former teacher, yeah. I'm saying this, like leveraging the power of that relationship, even just a small degree, Forget the traffic, the positioning that allows for you is incredibly powerful. So I look at, shameless plug, I look at what Wix has done in the last five years in, in, in large part because of you, but, you know, it, it used to be other brands, I won't call their names, and then Wix, and I, I'll kid you not, I was, I was talking this weekend about Wix and what you all do with regard to education, and that builds trust. So even if you didn't have the, the highest idea about Wix relative to your preferred platform, you started seeing all the educational video, the time you guys are putting in. And so what, what, what it makes, it starts building that association that aware of that affinity. It makes people more, makes you more trustworthy to people who then need that blog. Because you realize when I put my blog up, there's all this educational content and it's so accessible. You don't have to, you know, dig through the weeds to find the specific thing that you want. And you guys have leaned into what are the specific objections that our core audience would have with this product or service? It's the same thing with the restaurant. It's the same thing with the small blog, right? What What are the things that 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 are, that are going to kill the, any objections um, for some, someone who would be choosing our product or service? On the note of you shamelessly uh, 
plugging all the great work that the team, the wider Wix team has done, I think it's a good time to ask, where can people find you? Uh, so I use LinkedIn and Twitter to a lesser degree. I'm trying to use LinkedIn more. I, I, I'm writing more on RenellSmith.com um, because, because, you know, for years, I, I I just sat in this hole where I'm like, I'm, I'm tired of digital marketing content. I don't want to just talk about content strategy, but I realize I have all these stories, all these things to share that I've learned from, again, working with big brands, working with small brands. Then I'm like, you know, I want to share and help other small brands. That with personal this experience, that personal touch. Yeah. That's yeah. the, that's differentiator right there. So yeah, I will link to your blog in the in the show notes, and hopefully okay. we'll go and Thank check you. it out. Thank you. For sure. Thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Absolutely, man. Thanks, Morty. Have a great day. Yeah. And uh, to the audience, check out the SEO Rant next week. Look forward to the SEO Rant.com and SEO Rant on Twitter. And uh, doodles. <laughs>